428, Chapter 37 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 150. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover. And I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 428, Pillow Talk. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello! I am speaking to you from a hotel in Dallas, Texas. It has been so long since I've had to do something like this, because I haven't had a life for so long. But I'm here getting trained for a new gig, and I'm going to be here too long to record at home if I'm going to get this puppy out on time. So here we are in Dallas, and uh, I'm trying to use a relatively decent mic and my iPhone. So we'll see how it goes. I hope it doesn't hurt your delicate sensibilities and ears. But everything has been great. Uh, Podcasting conference was great. We found a lot of people who both are happy to learn about and very much in need of the factoids behind cognitive anchoring, as well as uh, just people who are interested in Craftlet. So, you know, it's always good to find more of our people. Well, this week, because I am on the road, there is no official crafty chat, although Erica was planning to Of course, I'm recording Monday, so I don't know. But Erica was planning to hop on a chat with everybody, so I hope that worked out. I will be in a training and then in the air on an airplane. So there is no crafty chat for this week. But we have a really great chapter, and we also have not a lot of information that needs to be transmitted to you. This is one of the kind of adventure chapters. So we will talk about more of it after we listen. In fact, the most important thing for you to know is not something new. It's just to remember that at the very end of chapter 36, the carnival scene, Albert has gone off with his lady love and poor France has been literally left in the dark. Everybody extinguishes their candles and France is left behind. And that is, that's the cliffhanger that Dumas left us with. We pick up immediately following that. Franz, still in the dark. But the light of understanding dawns on all of us before the end of today's chapter. So let's not waste any time. Let's get to chapter 37, The Catacombs of San Sebastian. Chapter 37, The Catacombs of San Sebastian. In his whole life, perhaps, Franz had never before experienced so sudden an impression, so rapid a transition from gaiety to sadness, as in this moment. It seemed as though Rome, under the magic breath of some demon of the night, had suddenly changed into a vast tomb. By a chance which added yet more to the intensity of the darkness, the moon which was on the wane did not rise until eleven o'clock and the streets which the young man traversed were plunged in the deepest obscurity. The distance was short, and at the end of ten minutes his carriage, or rather the Count's, stopped before the Hôtel de Londres. Dinner was waiting, but as Albert had told him that he should not return so soon, Franz sat down without him. Signor Pastrini, who had been accustomed to see them dine together, inquired into the cause of his absence. But Franz merely replied that Albert had received on the previous evening an invitation which he had accepted. The sudden extinction of the Moccoletti, the darkness which had replaced the light, and the silence which had succeeded the turmoil, had left in Franz's mind a certain depression, which was not free from uneasiness. He therefore dined very silently, in spite of the officious attention of his host, who presented himself two or three times to inquire if he wanted anything. Franz resolved to wait for Albert as late as possible. He ordered the carriage, therefore, for eleven o'clock, desiring Signor Pastrini 
to inform him the moment that Albert returned to the hotel. At eleven o'clock, Albert had not come back. Franz dressed himself and went out, telling his host that he was going to pass the night at the Duke of Bracciano's. The house of the Duke of Bracciano is one of the most delightful in Rome. The Duchess, one of the last heiresses of the Colonas, does its honours with the most consummate grace, and thus their fete have a European celebrity. Franz and Albert had brought to Rome letters of introduction to them, and their first question on his arrival was to inquire the whereabouts of his travelling companion. Franz replied that he had left him at the moment they were all about to extinguish the Mocoli, and that he had lost sight of him in the Via Macello. "'Then he has not returned,' said the Duke. "'I waited for him until this hour,' replied Franz. "'And do you know whither he went?' "'No, not precisely. However, I think it was something very like a rendezvous.' "'Diavolo!' said the Duke. "'This is a bad day, or rather a bad night, to be out late, is it not, Countess?' These words were addressed to the Countess G., who had just arrived and was leaning on the arm of Signor Tolonia, the Duke's brother. "'I think, on the contrary, that it is a charming night,' replied the Countess. "'And those who are here will complain of but one thing. It's too rapid flight.' "'I'm not speaking,' said the Duke, with a smile, "'of the persons who are here. The men run no other danger than that of falling in love with you, and the women of falling ill of jealousy at seeing you so lovely. I meant persons who were out in the streets of Rome. Ah, asked the Countess, who is out in the streets of Rome at this hour, unless it be to go to a ball? Our friend Albert de Morcerf, Countess, whom I left in pursuit of his unknown about seven o'clock this evening, said Franz, and whom I have not seen since. "'And don't you know where he is?' "'Not at all. "'Is he armed?' "'He is in masquerade.' "'You should not have allowed him to go,' said the Duke to Franz. "'You, who know Rome better than he does.' "'You might as well have tried to stop number three of the Barberi, "'who gained the prize in the race today,' replied Franz. "'And then, moreover, what could happen to him?' "'Who can tell?' The night is gloomy, and the Tiber is very near the Via Macello. Franz felt a sudden shudder run through his veins at observing that the feeling of the Duke and the Countess was so much in unison with his own personal disquietude. "'I informed them at the hotel that I had the honour of passing the night here, Duke,' said Franz, "'and desired them to come and inform me of his return.' "'Ah,' replied the Duke, "'Here, I think, is one of my servants who is seeking you.' The Duke was not mistaken. When he saw Franz, the servant came up to him. "'Your Excellency,' he said, "'the master of the Hotel de Londres has sent to let you know that a man is waiting for you with a letter from the Vicount of Morcerf.' "'A letter from the Vicomte?' exclaimed Franz. "'Yes. And who is the man?' "'I do not know.' "'Why did he not bring it to me here?' "'The messenger did not say.' "'And where is the messenger?' "'He went away directly. "'He saw me enter the ballroom to find you.' "'Oh,' said the Countess to Franz, "'go with all speed. "'Poor young man. "'Perhaps some accident has happened to him.' "'I will hasten,' replied Franz. "'Shall we see you again to give us any information?' "'inquired the Countess.' "'Yes, if it is not any serious affair. "'Otherwise I cannot answer as to what I may do myself.' "'Be prudent in any event,' said the Countess. "'Oh, pray be assured of that.' "'Franz took his hat and went away in haste. "'He had sent away his carriage with orders for it to fetch him at two o'clock. "'Fortunately, the Palazzo Bracciano, which is on one side in the Corso, "'and on the other in the Square of the Holy Apostles, "'is hardly ten minutes' walk from the Hotel de Londres.' As he came near the hotel, Franz saw a man in the middle of the street. He had no doubt that it was the messenger from Albert. The man was wrapped up in a large cloak. He went up to him, but to his extreme astonishment, the stranger first addressed him. "'What wants your excellency of me?' 
inquired the man, retreating a step or two as if to keep on his guard. "'Are not you the person who brought me a letter?' inquired Franz. "'From the Vicomte of Morcerf. "'Your Excellency Lodge is at Pastrini's hotel.' "'I do.' "'Your Excellency is the travelling companion of the Viscount.' "'I am.' "'Your Excellency's name is the Baron Franz d'Epinay. "'Then it is to Your Excellency that this letter is addressed.' "'Is there any answer?' inquired Franz, taking the letter from him. "'Yes, your friend at least hope so. "'Come upstairs with me, and I will give it to you.' "'I prefer waiting here,' said the messenger with a smile. "'And why?' "'Your Excellency will know when you have read the letter.' "'Shall I find you here, then?' "'Certainly.' Franz entered the hotel. On the staircase he met Signor Pastrini. "'Well,' said the landlord. "'Well, what?' responded Franz. "'You have seen the man who desired to speak with you from your friend?' he asked of Franz. "'Yes, I have seen him,' he replied, "'and he has handed this letter to me. "'Light the candles in my apartment, if you please.' The innkeeper gave orders to a servant to go before Franz with a light. The young man had found Signor Pastrini looking very much alarmed, and this had only made him the more anxious to read Albert's letter. And so he went instantly towards the wax-light and unfolded it. It was written and signed by Albert. Franz read it twice, before he could comprehend what it contained. It was thus worded. "'My dear fellow, the moment you have received this, have the kindness to take the letter of credit from my pocket-book, which you will find in the square drawer of the secretary.' Add your own to it, if it be not sufficient. Run to Torionia, draw from him instantly four thousand piastres, and give them to the bearer. It is urgent that I should have this money without delay. I do not say more. Rely on you as you may rely on me, your friend, Albert de Morcerf. P.S. I now believe in Italian banditti. Below these lines were written in a strange hand the following in Italian. Se alle sei della mattina, le quattro mille piastre non sono nelle mie mani, alla sette il conte Alberto avrà cessato di vivere. Luigi Vampa. If by six in the morning the four thousand piastre are not in my hands, by seven o'clock the Count Albert will have ceased to live. This second signature explained everything to Franz, who now understood the objection of the messenger to coming up into the apartment. The street was safer for him. Albert then had fallen into the hands of the famous bandit chief, in whose existence he had for so long a time refused to believe. There was no time to lose. He hastened to open the secretary and found the pocket-book in the drawer, and in it the letter of credit. There were in all six thousand piastres, but of these six thousand Albert had already expended three thousand. As to France, he had no letter of credit as he lived at Florence, and had only come to Rome to pass seven or eight days. He had brought but a hundred louis, and of these he had not more than fifty left. Thus seven or eight hundred piastres were wanting to them both to make up the sum that Albert required. True, he might in such a case rely on the kindness of Signor Torlonia, he was therefore about to return to the Palazzo Bracciano without loss of time, when suddenly a luminous idea crossed his mind. He remembered the Count of Monte Cristo. France was about to ring for Signor Pastrini, when that worthy presented himself. "'My dear sir,' he said hastily, "'do you know if the Count is within?' "'Yes, Your Excellency. He has this moment returned.' "'Is he in bed?' "'I should say no. "'Then ring at his door, if you please, "'and request him to be so kind as to give me an audience.' "'Signor Pastrini did as he was desired, "'and returning five minutes after, he said, "'The Count awaits your Excellency.' "'Franz went along the corridor, "'and a servant introduced him to the Count. "'He was in a small room which Franz had not yet seen, "'and which was surrounded with divans.' The Count came toward him. 
"'Well, what good wind blows you hither at this hour?' "'And he, "'Have you come to sup with me? "'It would be very kind of you.' "'No, I have come to speak to you of a very serious matter.' "'A serious matter?' said the Count, looking at Franz with the earnestness usual to him. "'And what may it be?' "'Are we alone?' "'Yes,' replied the Count, going to the door and returning. Franz gave him Albert's letter. "'Read that,' he said. The Count read it. "'Well, well,' said he. "'Did you see the postscript?' "'I did, indeed. "'Se alle sei della mattina le quattro mille piastre non sono nella mei mani, "'alla sette il conte Alberto avrà cessato di vivere. "'Luigi Vampa.' "'What think you of that?' inquired Franz. "'Have you the money he demands?' "'Yes, all but eight hundred piastres.' The Count went to his secretary, opened it, and pulling out a drawer filled with gold, said to Franz, "'I hope you will not offend me by applying to any one but myself.' "'You see, on the contrary, I come to you first and instantly,' replied Franz. "'And I thank you. Have what you will.' and he made a sign to Franz to take what he pleased. "'Is it absolutely necessary, then, to send the money to Luigi Vampa?' asked the young man, looking fixedly in his turn at the Count. "'Judge for yourself,' replied he. "'The postscript is explicit.' "'I think that if you would take the trouble of reflecting, you could find a way of simplifying the negotiation,' said Franz. "'How so?' returned the Count, with surprise." "'If we were to go together to Luigi Vampa, "'I am sure he would not refuse you Albert's freedom.' "'What influence can I possibly have over a bandit?' "'Have you not just rendered him a service "'that can never be forgotten?' "'What is that?' "'Have you not saved Peppino's life?' "'Well, well,' said the Count. "'Who told you that?' "'No matter. I know it.' The Count knit his brows, and remained silent an instant. "'And if I went to seek Vampa, would you accompany me?' "'If my society would not be disagreeable.' "'Be it so. It is a lovely night, and a walk without Rome will do us both good. "'Shall I take any arms?' "'For what purpose?' "'Any money?' "'It is useless. Where is the man who brought the letter?' "'In the street. He awaits the answer?' "'Yes. I must learn where we are going. I will summon him thither. "'It is useless. He would not come up. "'To your apartments, perhaps, but he will not make any difficulty at entering mine.' The Count went to the window of the apartment that looked onto the street, and whistled in a peculiar manner. The man in the mantle quitted the wall, and advanced into the middle of the street. "'Salite!' said the Count, in the same tone in which he would have given an order to his servant. The messenger obeyed without the least hesitation, but rather with alacrity, and mounting the steps at a bound, entered the hotel. Five seconds afterwards, he was at the door of the room. "'Ah, it is you, Peppino,' said the Count. But Peppino, instead of answering, threw himself on his knees, "'seized the Count's hand and covered it with kisses. "'Ah,' said the Count, "'you have then not forgotten that I saved your life. "'That is strange, for it is a week ago.' "'No, Excellency, and never shall I forget it,' "'returned Peppino, with an accent of profound gratitude. "'Never. That is a longer time. "'But it is something that you believe, so rise and answer.' Peppino glanced anxiously at Franz. "'Oh, you may speak before His Excellency,' said he. "'He is one of my friends. "'You allow me to give you this title,' continued the Count in French. "'It is necessary to excite this man's confidence.' "'You can speak before me,' said Franz. "'I am a friend of the Count's.' Oh, "'Good,' returned Peppino. "'I am ready to answer any questions Your Excellency may address to me.' "'How did the Viscount Albert fall into Luigi's hands?' "'Excellency, the Frenchman's carriage passed several times, 
the one in which was Teresa. The chief's mistress? Yes, the Frenchman threw her a bouquet. Teresa returned it, all this with the consent of the chief, who was in the carriage. What? cried Franz. Was Luigi Vampa in the carriage with the Roman peasants? It was he who drove it disguised as the coachman, replied Peppino. Well, said the Count. Well, then, the Frenchman took off his mask. Teresa, with the chief's consent, did the same. The Frenchman asked for a rendezvous. Teresa gave him one. Only, instead of Teresa, it was Beppo who was on the steps of the church of San Giacomo. What? exclaimed Franz. The peasant girl who snatched his moccoletto from him? Was a lad of fifteen, replied Peppino. "'But it was no disgrace to your friend to have been deceived. "'Beppo has taken in plenty of others.' "'And Beppo led him outside the walls?' said the Count. "'Exactly so. "'A carriage was waiting at the end of the Via Macello. "'Beppo got in, inviting the Frenchman to follow him, "'and he did not wait to be asked twice. "'He gallantly offered the right-hand seat to Beppo and sat by him.' Beppo told him he was going to take him to a villa, a league from Rome. The Frenchman assured him he would follow him to the end of the world. The coachman went up the Via di Ripetta and the Porta San Paolo, and when they were two hundred yards inside, as the Frenchman became somewhat too forward, Beppo put a brace of pistols to his head. The coachman pulled up and did the same. At the same time, Four of the band, who were concealed on the banks of the Almo, surrounded the carriage. The Frenchman made some resistance and nearly strangled Beppo, but he could not resist a five-armed man, and was forced to yield. They made him get out, walk along the banks of the river, and then brought him to Teresa and Luigi, who were waiting for him in the catacombs of San Sebastian. Well, said the Count, turning towards France, "'It seems to me that this is a very likely story. "'What did you say to it?' "'Why, that I should think it very amusing,' replied Franz, "'if it had happened to any one but poor Albert. "'And in the truth, if you had not found me here,' said the Count, "'it might have proved a gallant adventure which would have cost your friend dear. "'But now, be assured, his alarm will be the only serious consequence.' "'And shall we go and find him?' inquired Franz. "'Oh, decidedly, sir. "'He is in a very picturesque place. "'Do you know the catacombs of San Sebastian?' "'I was never in them, but I have often resolved to visit them. "'Well, here is an opportunity made to your hand, "'and it would be difficult to contrive a better. "'Have you a carriage?' "'No. "'That is of no consequence.' "'I always have one ready, day and night.' "'Always ready?' "'Yes, I am a very capricious being, "'and I should tell you that sometimes when I arise, "'or after my dinner, or in the middle of the night, "'I resolve on starting for some particular point, "'and away I go.' "'The Count rang, and a footman appeared. "'Order out the carriage,' he said, "'and remove the pistols which are in the holsters. "'You need not awaken the coachman.' Ali will drive. In a very short time the noise of the wheels was heard, and the carriage stopped at the door. The Count took out his watch. Half past twelve, he said. We might start at five o'clock and be in time, but the delay may cause your friend to pass an uneasy night, and therefore we had better go with all speed to extricate him from the hands of the infidels. Are you still resolved to accompany me? More determined than ever— "'Well, then, come along.' Franz and the Count went downstairs, accompanied by Peppino. At the door they found the carriage. Ali was on the box, in whom Franz recognised the dumb slave of the grotto of Monte Cristo. Franz and the Count got into the carriage. Peppino placed himself beside Ali, and they set off at a rapid pace. Ali had received his instructions and went down the Corso, crossed the Campo Vaccino, went up the Strada San Gregorio, and reached the gates of San Sebastian. Then the porter raised some difficulties. 
but the Count of Monte Cristo produced a permit from the Governor of Rome, allowing him to leave or enter the city at any hour of the day or night. The portcullis was therefore raised, the porter had a louis for his trouble, and they went on their way. The road which the carriage now traversed was the ancient Appian Way, and bordered with tombs. From time to time, by the light of the moon which began to rise, Franz imagined that he saw something like a sentinel appear at various points among the ruins, and suddenly retreat into the darkness on a signal from Peppino. A short time before they reached the baths of Caracalla, the carriage stopped. Peppino opened the door, and the Count and Franz alighted. "'In ten minutes,' said the Count to his companion, "'we shall be there.' He then took Peppino aside, gave him an order in a low voice, and Peppino went away, taking with him a torch brought with them in the carriage. Five minutes elapsed, during which Franz saw the shepherd going along a narrow path that led over the irregular and broken surface of the campagna, and finally he disappeared in the midst of the tall red herbage, which seemed like the bristling mane of an enormous lion. "'Now,' said the Count, "'let us follow him.' Franz and the Count, in their turn, then advanced along the same path, which, at the distance of a hundred paces, led them over a declivity to the bottom of a small valley. They then perceived two men conversing in the obscurity. "'Ought we to go on?' asked Franz of the Count. "'Or shall we wait a while?' "'Let us go on. Peppino will have warned the sentry of our coming.' One of the two men was Peppino, and the other a bandit on the lookout. Franz and the Count advanced, and the bandit saluted them. "'Your Excellency,' said Peppino, addressing the Count, "'if you will follow me, the opening of the catacombs is close at hand.' "'Go on, then,' replied the Count. They came to an opening behind a clump of bushes, and in the midst of a pile of rocks by which a man could scarcely pass. Peppino glided first into this crevice, after they got along a few paces, the passage widened. Peppino passed, lighted his torch, and turned to see if they came after him. The Count first reached an open space, and Franz followed him closely. The passageway sloped in a gentle descent, enlarging as they proceeded. Still Franz and the Count were compelled to advance in a stooping posture, and were scarcely able to proceed abreast of one another. They went on a hundred and fifty paces in this way, and then were stopped by— "'Who comes there?' At the same time they saw the reflection of a torch on a carbine barrel. "'A friend,' responded Peppino, and, advancing alone towards the sentry, he said a few words to him in a low tone, and then he, like the first, saluted the nocturnal visitors, making a sign that they may, may proceed. Behind the sentinel was a staircase with twenty steps. France and the Count descended these, and found themselves in a mortuary chamber.' Five corridors diverged like the rays of a star, and the walls, dug into niche, which were arranged one above the other in the shape of coffins, showed that they were at last in the catacombs. Down one of the corridors, whose extent it was impossible to determine, rays of light were visible. The Count laid his hand on Francis's shoulder. "'Would you like to see a camp of bandits in repose?' he inquired. "'Exceedingly,' replied Franz. "'Come with me, then, Peppino. Put out the torch.' Peppino obeyed, and Franz and the Count were in utter darkness, except that fifty paces in advance of them, a reddish glare, more evidence since Peppino had put out his torch, was visible along the wall. They advanced silently, the Count guiding Franz as if he had the singular faculty of seeing in the dark. Franz himself, however, saw his way more plainly in proportion as he went on towards the light which served in some manner as a guide. Three arcades were before them, and the middle one was used as a door. These arcades opened on one side into the corridor where the Count and Franz were, and on the other into a large square chamber, entirely surrounded by niche, similar to those of which we have spoken. In the midst of this chamber were four stones, which had formerly served as an altar, as was evident from the cross which still surmounted them. A lamp placed at the base of a pillar lighted up with its pale and flickering flame the singular scene which presented itself to the eyes of the two visitors concealed in the shadow. 
a man was seated with his elbow leaning on the column and was reading with his back turned to the arcades through the openings of which the newcomers contemplated him this was the chief of the band luigi vampa around him and in groups according to their fancy lying in their mantles or with their backs against a sort of stone bench which went all around the columbarium were to be seen twenty brigands or more each having his carbine within reach at the other end silently scarcely visible and like a shadow was a sentinel who was walking up and down before a grotto which was only distinguishable because in that spot the darkness seemed more dense than elsewhere when the count thought Franz had gazed sufficiently on this picturesque tableau he raised his finger to his lips to warn him to be silent and ascending the three steps which led to the corridor of the columbarium entered the chamber by the middle arcade and advanced towards vampa who was so intent on the book before him that he did not hear the noise of his footsteps who comes a there cried the sentinel who was less abstracted and who saw by the lamplight a shadow approaching his chief at this challenge vampa rose quickly drawing at the same moment a pistol from his girdle in a moment all the bandits were on their feet and twenty carbines were leveled at the count well said he in a voice perfectly calm and no muscle of his countenance disturbed well my dear vampa it appears to me that you receive a friend with a great deal of ceremony ground arms exclaimed the chief with an imperative sign of the hand while with the other he took off his hat respectfully then turning to the singular personage who had caused this scene he said your pardon your excellency but i was so far from expecting the honour of a visit that i did not really recognise you it seems that your memory is equally short in everything vampa said the count and that not only do you forget people's faces but also the conditions you make with them what conditions have i forgotten your excellency inquired the bandit with the air of a man who having committed an error is anxious to repair it was it not agreed asked the count that not only my person but also that of my friends should be respected by you and how have i broken that treaty your excellency you have this evening carried off and conveyed hither the vicomte albert de morcerf well continued the count in a tone that made france shudder this young gentleman is one of my friends this young gentleman lodges in the same hotel as myself this young gentleman has been up and down the corso for eight hours in my private carriage and yet i repeat to you you have carried him off and conveyed him hither and added the count taking the letter from his pocket you have set a ransom on him as if he were an utter stranger why did you not tell me all this you inquired the brigand chief turning towards his men who all retreated before his look have you caused me thus to fall in my word towards a gentleman like the count who has all our lives in his hands by heavens if i thought one of you knew that the young gentleman was the friend of his excellency i would blow his brains out with my own hand well said the count turning towards france i told you there was some mistake in this are you not alone asked vampa with uneasiness i am with the person to whom this letter was addressed and to whom i desired to prove that luigi vampa was a man of his word come your excellency the count added turning to france here is luigi vampa who will himself express to you his deep regret at the mistake he has committed france approached the chief advancing several steps to meet him welcome among us your excellency he said to him you heard what the count just said and also my reply let me add that i would not for the four thousand piastres at which i had fixed your friend's ransom that this had happened but said franz looking around him uneasily where is the vicomte i do not see him nothing has happened to him i hope said the count frowningly the prisoner is there replied vampa pointing to the hollow space in front of which the bandit was on guard and i will go myself and tell him he is free 
the chief went towards the place he had pointed out as Albert's prison, and Franz and the Count followed him. "'What is the prisoner doing?' inquired Vampa of the sentinel. "'Ma foi, Captain,' replied the sentry, "'I do not know. For the last hour I have not heard him stir.' "'Come in, Your Excellency,' said Vampa. The Count and Franz ascended seven or eight steps after the chief, who drew back a bolt and opened a door. Then, by the gleam of a lamp similar to that which lighted the columbarium, Albert was to be seen wrapped up in a cloak which one of the bandits had lent to him, lying in a corner in profound slumber. "'Come,' said the Count, smiling with his own peculiar smile, not so bad for a man who is to be shot at seven o'clock to-morrow morning vampa looked at albert with a kind of admiration he was not insensible to such a proof of courage you are right your excellency he said this must be one of your friends then going to albert he touched him on the shoulder saying will your excellency please to awaken albert stretched out his arms rubbed his eyelids, and opened his eyes. "'Oh,' said he, "'is it you, Captain? You should have allowed me to sleep. I had such a delightful dream. I was dancing the gallop at Trollonio's with the Countess G.' Then he drew his watch from his pocket, that he might see how time sped. "'Half past one only,' said he. "'Why the devil do you rouse me at this hour?' "'To tell you that you are free, Your Excellency.' "'My dear fellow,' said Albert, with perfect ease of mind, "'remember for the future Napoleon's maxim. "'Never awaken me but for bad news. "'If you had let me slip on, I should have finished my gallop, "'and have been grateful to you all my life. "'So then, they have paid my ransom?' "'No, Your Excellency. "'Well, then, how am I free? "'A person to whom I can refuse nothing has come to demand you.' "'Come hither. Yes, hither. Really? Then that person is a most amiable person.' Albert looked around and perceived Franz. "'What?' said he. "'Is it you, my dear Franz, whose devotion and friendship are thus displayed?' "'No, not I,' replied Franz. "'But our neighbour, the Count of Monte Cristo.' "'Oh, my dear Count!' said Albert, gaily, arranging his cravat and wristbands. "'You are really most kind, and I hope you will consider me as under eternal obligations to you, in the first place for the carriage, and in the next for this visit.' And he put out his hand to the Count, who shuddered as he gave his own, but who nevertheless did give it. The bandit gazed on this scene with amazement. He was evidently accustomed to see his prisoners tremble before him, and yet here was one whose gay temperament was not that for a moment altered as for France. He was enchanted at the way in which Albert had sustained the national honour in the presence of the bandit. "'My dear Albert,' he said, "'if you will make haste, we shall yet have time to finish the night at Torlonia's. You may conclude your interrupted gallop, so that you will owe no ill-will to Signor Luigi, who has indeed, throughout this whole affair, acted like a gentleman.' "'You are decidedly right, and we may reach the palazzo by two o'clock, Signor Luigi,' continued Albert. "'Is there any formality to fulfil before I take leave of Your Excellency?' "'None, sir,' replied the bandit. "'You are as free as air.' "'Well, then, a happy and merry life to you. Come, gentlemen, come.' And Albert, followed by Franz and the Count, descended the staircase, crossed the square chamber, where stood all the bandits, hat in hand. Peppino, said the brigand chief, "'give me the torch.' "'What are you going to do?' inquired the Count. "'I will show you the way back myself,' said the captain. "'That is the least honour that I can render to your excellency.' And taking the lighted torch from the hands of the herdsman, he preceded his guests, not as a servant who performs an act of civility, but like a king who precedes ambassadors. On reaching the door he bowed. "'And now, Your Excellency,' added he, "'allow me to repeat my apologies, and I hope you will not entertain any resentment at what has occurred.' 
"'No, my dear Vampa,' replied the Count. "'Besides, you compensate for your mistakes in so gentlemanly a way that one almost feels obliged to you for having committed them.' "'Gentlemen,' added the chief, turning towards the young men, "'perhaps the offer may not appear very tempting to you, but if you should ever feel inclined to pay me a second visit wherever I may be, you shall be welcome.' France and Albert bowed. The Count went out first, then Albert. France paused for a moment. "'Has Your Excellency anything to ask me?' said Vampa, with a smile. "'Yes, I have,' replied France. "'I am curious to know what work you are perusing with so much attention as we entered.' "'César's commentaries,' said the bandit. "'It is my favourite work.' "'Well,' "'Are you coming?' asked Albert. "'Yes,' replied Franz. "'Here I am.' And he, in his turn, left the caves. They advanced to the plain. "'Ah, oh, your pardon,' said Albert, turning around. "'Will you allow me, Captain?' And he lighted his cigar at Vampa's torch. "'Now, my dear Count,' he said, "'let us on with all the speed we may. I am enormously anxious to finish my night at the Duke of Bracciano's. They found the carriage where they had left it. The Count said a word in Arabic to Ali, and the horses went on at great speed. It was just two o'clock by Elbert's watch when the two friends entered into the dancing-room. Their return was quite an event, but as they entered together, all uneasiness on Albert's account ceased instantly. "'Madame,' said the Viscount of Morcerf, advancing towards the Countess, "'Yesterday you were so condescending as to promise me a gallop. "'I am rather late in claiming this gracious promise, "'but here is my friend, whose character for veracity you will know, "'and he will assure you the delay arose from no fault of mine.' "'And as at this moment the orchestra gave the signal for the waltz, "'Albert put his arm round the waist of the countess "'and disappeared with her in the whirl of dancers.' In the meanwhile, Franz was considering the singular shudder that had passed over the Count of Monte Cristo at the moment when he had been in some sort forced to give his hand to Albert. End of chapter 37 So there were several really interesting things, I thought, going on in today's chapter, and I thought maybe we could start with the easiest things and work our way towards the most philosophically complex. The easiest thing to deal with was Luigi Vampa. What is he reading? He's reading the commentaries of Caesar. There are many layers to why this is so cool. Caesar wrote two commentaries, one on the wars that he waged in Gaul. That was his big campaign that made him famous. And then there was a second set of commentaries that was, I think, short, was shorter, or at least had fewer books slash chapters. Uh, and that was on his taking of Italy when he fought Pompey. This is the stuff that everybody's talking about at the beginning of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. So it turns out that the stories that Caesar wrote down in the commentaries about Gaul, the, the big battles that made him famous, he was evidently a really good writer or he had a spectacular editor because for centuries, this book of commentaries was actually used to teach Latin. The Latin was so precise and, and written so tightly and so well and descriptively that this was a text that kids would copy out and practice with. And I mean, it's been a couple thousand years that the book's been lying around. So it isn't a surprise that Luigi Vampa was reading about a great warrior and his campaigns and his logic and his strategy. And B, he's probably reading it in the original Italian. And see, as we knew from the stories of him before, this guy's ambitious. He's, he's certainly leveraging the bandit mystique to his benefit, but he is also quite a gentleman, right? I mean, we saw some really interesting behavior once again coming from thieves or smugglers or people who, at the time that Alexandre Dumas was writing this book, people who would have been considered the lowest of the low people you could never, ever, ever trust, people who would, well, people who you probably wouldn't come into contact with anyway. 
And this is one of the problems that we see in our own world. We get so used to living in our own time, our own place, our own group, our own neighborhood, town, city, ideology, that it's it's very hard to understand slash recognize slash be a part of, even temporarily, anything else. And I had a really interesting time talking to some teachers here this week while we've been going through the training, because we're all going to get pushed out of our comfort zone. We're all getting pushed into going to places that are very far away, places that we've never been to. And we're working with people who live there and trying to coordinate what we know we have to teach and what they know about their culture and their world and the the people who they work with every day. And it's just, honestly, it's so much fun because it's something I don't get to do very often. I'm, I know I'm not supposed to assume anything, but it doesn't seem like anybody really has that much time to get out and about and find this kind of thing. And it certainly would have been the same in Dumas day. You know, you're, you're part of a social class, you're part of a community. You don't have a whole lot of reason to go hang with the bandits. So it must have been shocking and probably a little bit disturbing to Dumas' audience to have this Luigi Vampa turn out to be so honorable. He won't take the Count's money. They grab the torch. They take them back to the entrance of the catacombs, which is no small feat. And they've treated Albert with real dignity. You know, we, we know that when we uh, first see Albert sleeping, that the cloak that he's been wrapped in was loaned to him by one of the guys. Because, you know, they don't want him freezing to death. You don't want him to come and hunt you down once his ransom has been paid, you know, out of vengeance for the, his mistreatment. And then there's that that moment where Vampa looks at Albert sleeping there so peacefully, so quietly, as though it really doesn't matter that he's supposed to get shot in the morning <laughs> if nobody brings the money. Vampa sees that and thinks, wow, that shows a lot of courage. It is impossible to know what's going through the Count's mind. We can surmise uh, a few things about the Count's reaction, particularly because when it is time to shake Albert's hand, when Albert offers his hand to the Count, the Count shudders like a full body shudder, which Franz then comments on again later. So my guess is that the Count didn't look at that and say, wow, he's really brave. I, I can't help but wonder if the Count looked at that and said, wow, he's really shallow and not very bright. And I don't know which attitude is the right one in this case. Albert certainly has a, a generosity of spirit that is surprising. You know, he's, he's not angry at his captors. He, he had his little adventure, and he doesn't seem to be particularly overwrought about the girl not being the woman of his dreams. And, and he's just kind of zen about the whole thing. You know, you just, you just roll with him. He's, he's Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Hey, you just have to go with it. That's kind of terrifying, actually, but I have always pictured Albert as kind of blonde with <laughs> the long blonde romantic Lalio hair from the Commedia dell'arte, kind of the, the, you know, the young lover hair, the glorious Fabio, <laughs> wavy golden locks. And that's, that is kind of scarily Jeff Spicoli and maybe Albert now. Hmm. We'll have to see. We got a little bit of listener feedback from listener Lauren, who has something to share with us about Rome. I'm really, really glad she called this week because I think this is an excellent chapter for us to hear. Hi, Heather. This is Lauren. I had previously sent you a voicemail about the trip to Notre Dame when you were asking for places to go in and around Paris or, you know, other nifty places that you'll be able to visit on your time off. But I was wanted to comment today because uh, you were talking about how the book is like a travelogue uh, at this point when it's described in Rome. And I always wanted to say how very much I felt like that, uh, particularly in the last chapter, but in this one as well. I've been to Rome twice. I was there in 2006 and then again in 2007, uh, first with my family and then for my honeymoon because my husband is a huge church history nerd. And in the chapter from the last time, I think 
I have been to every single place that was mentioned. I've been to the Spanish Steps, I've been to Casa del Popolo, I've been to Santa Maria del Popolo, I've been outside of that gate, like when they were describing going out and then coming in through a gate and approaching the Colosseum from the other direction so that you're not passing the forums, like I know, you know, roughly the direction they would be coming from, the, the roads have changed a little bit. There was no Via de Fori Imperiali, which is the road that Mussolini built across the entire middle of the forums uh, in Dumas Day. But it's so funny because it's, you know, this is an old book and yet everything is very, very similar. Still, Rome is such an old city. And of course, it still has things like when you go to the Colosseum, there are a zillion tour guides outside who want to sell you like, oh, come and have my tour and I'll tell you all the stories and, you know, take you to a special place where you can see a special thing, which is really not anything that you can't get to on your own unless maybe you didn't notice it was there. So, you know, we paid for it the first time and then uh, my husband and I didn't because I said, I don't think they really showed us anything that was extra. And I can tell you all the stories because I heard it last time. And the other thing, though, that I wanted to mention um, was that they mentioned Castel Sant'Angelo, and they mentioned another, another time, I think they said the Papal Fortress, and I don't think they really made it clear that those were the same thing, that Castel Sant'Angelo, or maybe it was the Papal Prison. Castel Sant'Angelo was used as a prison for a while. It's also like the, the fortress where like they would go and, um, you know, when, this, when the Vatican was actually under attack by armies, they had this special route, route where they take the Pope there from his rooms in the near in St. Peter's to Castel Sant'Angelo where he'd be safe. So anyway, I just wanted to say, as someone who's been to Rome, how much I appreciated the travelogue aspect of this and how many memories it brought back. Uh, and thank you so much for the podcast. Bye. All right. So the Catacombs of St. Sebastian. St. Sebastian was first introduced to me in the museum of his catacombs by a sign that said the perforated saint and martyr, which it was one of those moments where, as a early 20-something-year-old, I came really close to bursting into laughter, even though I knew it was probably really inappropriate. Uh, the reason St. Sebastian was called the perforated St. Sebastian is because he was a Christian martyr in the uh, pre-just, barely pre-Diocletian era. Sebastian had been part of the Praetorian Guard, and he was, he actually was doing really, really well. He was also hiding his Christianity, and then at some point it was figured out, and Diocletian got really ticked off and said, go and tie him to a post, and brought in all of these archers from Mauritania to fire on him. And so when you see in Christian iconographic art from the beginning of Christian iconographic art all the way up until the late Renaissance, and, and probably after that, but I'm, I'm just talking about the ones where I've seen this as a presentation. There is often a saint. He is full of arrows. I, the poor man is just looking kind of like a sea urchin. And, um, and that's how you know it's St. Sebastian. There, we've talked about it before on the podcast that there are certain things that you will see that belong to, and I'm putting air quotes around that, belong to certain saints and martyrs. And so you're able to tell who they are when you're looking at the artwork. He was supposed to be a really important saint during the plague years. It was one of those things that if you pray for him to intercede for you, um, you might survive the plague, which, you know, anything to help you survive the plague, I think, was a good thing. So St. Sebastian, very, very early saint, very, very real man. Um, there's a whole other half of the story about what happened to him after he was perforated. And I, I found conflicting reports on the veracity of that and all sorts of stuff. But it doesn't matter much because the important part is the word catacomb, which now is is tied to Christian burial grounds. And I, I don't know about you, but the image that it evokes is very much the cask of Amontillado, kind of the the dark, dank kind of dripping underground hive of tunnels where people were buried, because that's the image that I have of Cask of Amontillado. So you can imagine my surprise when I went to the catacombs of San Sebastian and was met with uh, definitely tunnels, so sure, and they were very much underground, mostly 
And there were, in fact, uh, these kind of rectangular holes in the sides of the wall. And sometimes there were like uh, little cul-de-sacs that you could go into where there were other rectangular holes in the wall. These were like shelves that people were buried in. And that was just the way it was done. And obviously, if you go on a tour, you are not going to find bodies there anymore. They aren't mummified. Um, there were, I think they had a couple of like pseudo bodies just so you would get the, the idea. And they're small, the, the rectangles. The rectangles are small and that kind of surprised me too. I'm always shocked to see how much taller we are now than we used to be human wise. So you have the rectangular holes in the wall. You also had some square holes in the wall, which were for urns. And some of these rooms, eventually, you go through just kind of the cavey parts and they've strung lights up. It's not like you have to use a torch to go in there anymore. You eventually get to some rooms that are still in really, really good shape. That's because these the catacombs are not wet at all. Uh, some of them had plastered ceilings with the kind of fiddly bits that you might see in a, a Victorian era or, or even earlier house, like where you get the medallions around a chandelier where it connects to the ceiling or plaster versions of those tin ceilings that you might see in uh, New York City or Chicago in, in buildings from the 20s. Same idea. And then the next thing that shocked me when we were going through the catacombs back in, this would be 1993, was that it was for me, the first time I had experienced the, yeah, and then the next people come along and build on top thing. Like when the archaeologists started to say, hey, we think we found Troy <laughs> nine levels down in this one part of, what is it, Turkey, where, where they found Troy. This is kind of the same thing. And I started to talk about the word catacomb being odd. It's because the word catacomb comes from Greek, kata. And kimbe, kata kimbe, kata kumbas is what it gets to in Italian or in Latin. And it means literally close to the cavity. And it's obviously not a cavity in your mouth. It's because this was a silica mine. It's not exactly silica. It's, it's a long, longer explanation. But the, this particular kind of silica-like substance when mixed with water and a couple of other things becomes kind of like concrete. So obviously very useful if you are living in Rome in the 200s, the 300s. But because it had been a mine for so long, and it still is visible from the road, kind of a depression in the field next to it because it, it sunk in because they mined a bunch of stuff. So there were tunnels that were already built there from the mining, which is very convenient. And then because St. Sebastian was so important, and because for a certain amount of time, they say that the remains of Saints Peter and Paul were kept there as well, it became kind of an important place. Plus, it's just outside the walls of Rome. It was on the Appian Way, so main drag to go pretty much anywhere else towards the east. And it's a place where you can hide. But that's not all. Because even before the Christians got in on the action, this particular area, no longer a mine, but still extant, it was still uh, tunnels, was a pagan cemetery. And so when I was talking about the, the layers, like for the city of Troy, you have the Christian layer, you have a pagan layer, and I think those overlapped a bit. And then the Basilica of San Sebastian was built. So that's a whole new layer that's put on top of the other layers. And that's, it's actually got a very purposeful name. It's San Sebastiano, Fuori, which is outside, and La Mura, outside the walls. Right? I know. So the basilica was built originally in the first half of the fourth century. The basilica that's there right now was built in the uh, 17th century, and that was actually commissioned by a cardinal, the cardinal of that, that area. So you've got the basilica, 
And there's part of the Basilica, if I'm remembering this correctly, and if I'm not, and you've been there more recently than I have, please use the listener line and call in and tell me. Area code 206 350 So the thing that I started to say before I corrected myself. So there's uh, one part of the catacomb that I recall where there were three expansive burial chambers. At least one of them had stairs down into it and um, it was gated off so you couldn't go down. But these were very, very early, clearly rich people burial sites. And there was all this really interesting art and graffiti on the walls. And some of it they've been able to translate because enough of it was left. And it was graffiti about Saints Peter and Paul. So kind of like God rules on the wall. But then you also had at least one of those tombs was a pagan one or at least a somebody who hadn't quite decided perhaps whether they were going to go pagan or Christian because there were uh, pagan iconographic symbols on the walls, including a swastika. Because that, that pinwheel shape that we associate so much now, so, well, so much entirely associate with the Nazis, that symbol was around for a long time before it pops up in, I know I've seen it in India, Indian art, as well as several other places. And that makes sense, right? Because it's a pinwheel. So that was kind of interesting to see on the wall. And, and these frescoes, because I, I can't think they, they must have been some sort of fresco-ish thing because there's plaster. Even though I know that more modern frescoes faded really badly, I'm wondering maybe somebody who is listening is an art history major and knows what kind of pigments they were using at this time in and around the, the area of Rome. Because now that I'm thinking about it, you know, those, those frescoes, they were fixing the um, Sistine Chapel, not the ceiling, but they were fixing one of the walls in the, the Sistine Chapel. There's, the chapel's actually very small. And there's a big mural on one wall, and then the arched roof leads off of that down to the other wall. So you've got the long, narrow kind of transept thing going on there. And then on the other wall, there's, there's a, a mirrored, giant mural piece of art, which I'm blanking on the subject of, but obviously it has something to do with Christianity. So they were revamping that, and it was very interesting to see to see these people up there with Q-tips and water, just trying to clean off the, the damage that was done. And then they bring in very specialized art people to fix any colors that have faded and gone wrong, because sometimes they fade into a different color, which is why sometimes you see these really weird co color combinations from paintings in the long ago. But neither here nor there. Uh, the really important thing is to remember that you've got several layers of really interesting stuff happening. And back when Dumas was writing this, they knew it was several layers of really interesting stuff happening as well. It isn't just us looking back on Dumas' time the way that so, ha so often happens on Craftlet. Dumas is closer to us in the grand history of time than he is to people who used the catacombs. And in fact, he might be, I would have to actually sit down and do the math, he might be equidistant between the people who built the basilica and us. He might be right in the middle or a little closer to us, which is so weird to think about. So Dumas looking back at this ancient stuff with all sorts of history wrapped around it and layers of history actually visible in the catacombs. And people had been touring the catacombs even when Dumas was going and visiting Rome. So that's all really cool. Plus, you can see the floor. They've, they've built it in such a way that you can see the underside of the floor of the basilica in one part, uh, close to the, the three, I think it was close to the three big mausoleum tombs, the family tombs. But it, it, there's like a, a ledge that you can see over the edge of, and then you can, above you, you can see the bottom of the flagstone floor. And I think our tour guide said that that level, the ledge that we were able to look over, had been exposed. It had been exposed ground at one point before the basilica was built, but during the time when the catacombs were being used and people would come and picnic there. And that archaeologists had found you know, detritus from people's picnics. So you've got all these layers, you've got all this history. Dumas knew all of this. And then you have Luigi Vampa, 
And Luigi Vampa is reading a history of ancient Rome about Caesar. Well, a a book by Caesar about his Gaul campaign. And he's sitting inside one of these, one of these rooms off in one of the cul-de-sac rooms in the catacombs. And yes, you totally could get lost in there if they, if they hadn't hung the lights for us. Obviously, you're down in a cave system. It would be really easy to get turned around and get lost. I mean, they're not built to be evil and to purposefully get you mixed up, but I can absolutely see how you could. So the fact that Vampa leads our boys out is really cool. And the fact that Dumas decided to have Vampa use the catacombs, this this pivot point of history, as the location where he was going to store Albert while they were while they were holding him for ransom. He's a really interestingly classy kind of guy for a bandit. So once again, and it keeps happening, Dumas lets us affiliate ourselves with people who we would never come into contact with, certainly not if we were reading this when the book came out, but also people who we, even today, would probably have some stereotypes about as well. It's kind of like if you watched The Wire and uh, Idris Elba's character. At some point during the first season, you start to see him going someplace where he's wearing a suit and tie. And this is like kingpin drug dealer guy. And you start and go, hmm. And as it goes on, eventually it's, it is revealed, and I won't spoil it for you, but it is revealed what he's doing. And the moment that you find it out is one of those delicious moments that I just love in life where you've given in to a, a very simplistic stereotype about a, a person or a group of people or a place, and you find an exception to the stereotype that makes you rethink the stereotype entirely. I love having that happen. And this in The Wire was one of them. And this with Luigi Vampa is one of them. So I dig that. So the final thing I am going to leave you with, and it's a question, and it is a question that will pop up over and over and over, I think for the rest of the book. And the the question has a framework that will be repeated over and over again, but the details within that framework will alter from time to time. But the question I'm going to leave you with right now is this. Who was actually involved in, knew about and involved in, the capture of Albert and the, the larger deception? Because it was a huge setup, right? You had to have the, the girl in the carriage and, and Luigi Vampa in on the whole thing and driving the carriage, for goodness sake. And, um, and so who, who all we know the Count was involved? And we know Vampa, right? But did Vampa tell his guys? So when he's saying to his men, when they're in the catacombs, hey, you didn't tell me that this was the friend of the Count of Monte Cristo. Is it all just play acting? Do all his guys know? Did he not tell them? It is an interesting question. Who knows what and who knew it when is going to be our framework for many chapters from here on out. So that is the little happy tidbit that I will leave you with. I want to say thank you to our new Patreon patrons, Ellen B., Shelley F., and Allison K. Thank you so much for supporting Craftlet. I hope you are enjoying War of the Worlds, and I'll talk to you later. Take care. Have a great one. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlet.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlet has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.